We're going to go ahead and get started because, like I said, I've got an hour here. And, and I want to talk about uh, probably one of the things that a lot of my dealers uh, hit me with today about box stores. And probably the Internet's a big issue, issue with it. And so I wanted to really build kind of a workshop of talking about how do, we, how do we compete against the box stores? How do we compete against the Internet uh, and make money in it? Because if you've been in my workshops before, we're in business to do one thing and one thing only, which is to do what? Make money. How much money? If you've been in my workshops, this word should... How much money? Obscene amounts. Okay, so, so if we're going to be in business, and I tell people, I've been in business for 27 years. I've had money. I've not had money. Is it better to have money? Yes. I've had a little, and I've been blessed to have a lot. A lot seems to be better than a little. Will we all get an amen on that? Okay, all right. So any, anything we do in our dealership, everything we do in our dealership has to produce us what? Money. If it's not making us money, we either have to fix it so it makes us money or we have to stop doing it. Are we all in agreement with that? So I tell people that's our only option. So if I'm doing something in my store or something's happening, I either have to make money on it or if I'm not making money on it, I have to fix it so I'm making money. And if it's not making me money, then I have to then and I can't fix it, then I've got to do what? Now, I'm going to talk in my next workshop at 2 o'clock about hiring people, but I tell people it's the same thing. If you've got an employee, they're there to help you make what? Money. And so if they don't make you money, you either have to fix it so they do make you money or you have to find somebody who can come in and do what? Make you money. Because I tell people that's what it's all about. We're in business to make what kind of money? I've seen amounts of money. All right, very good. All right, so let's talk about this. Now, one of the things... As a matter of fact, there's a good book I just read here uh, a, f a few weeks ago, and it's called David and Goliath. And if you want to read a book, and it's really about uh, the gentleman. Did anybody read a book called The Tipping Point? Okay. The, the gentleman that wrote The Tipping Point wrote a new book called David and Goliath. And, and, uh, and I, was, I was reading this book, and it's really, uh, the book kind of is uh, a little bit of a misnomer because you think it's about the, you know, the uh, underdog winning. And as he was going through this, he told the story about David and Goliath. Now, we're all familiar with the story of David and Goliath, right? So we have the little guy that takes on the big giant, and the little guy wins. And the thing that he was talking about was this, the story's not really told in the right way because there's a lot of things about the story that, that you're never really taught. And, and one of the things that as I was reading the story, and I, and I hadn't really thought about it before, but he said, you know, really the story of uh, is, uh, David and Goliath is not about an underdog winning. It's about uh, somebody do, doing something differently. Goliath, if you remember the story, Goliath was the giant. And so you had his army over on the banks over here, and then you had Saul's army on the banks over here, and you had the valley down there. And so the, 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 the uh, Goliath's army, they were over there, and they were saying, you know, we're going to kill you. And Saul's army was over here and saying, okay, no, you're not. We're going to kill you. And so they were shouting back and forth. And that was pretty common back then. So during those times back then, seldom did the armies all rush down like you see in the movies and do hand-to-hand -hand combat. Normally they would all stand up there. Each army would select somebody to represent them and they would go down to the middle and they would do battle. So why waste all your people? Let's just send, the, our, send your best guy down. We'll send our best guy down. They will fight. And when it's done, whoever wins becomes the, the master and the other. Whoever loses, your whole army becomes our slave. And so that was a pretty common thing that happened back then. Well, well, they picked Goliath. He's the big, strong guy. And he went down to the valley down there. Now, the Goliath, if you think about military, uh, in the military you have, and, and you have throughout history. I was a history major in college. And basically in history, in the military, you have the cavalry. Now, it could be horses, chariots, Abrams tanks, Black Hawk helicopters, but you have this mobile fleet that moves around. They're the cavalry so much. Then you have your artillery. Now, today in artillery are the howitzers and the, and the things like this, but back in the day, arrows were the artillery. So you had the archers that could stand back a long way and sling arrows into a group of people. So you had the artillery. Then you had still like what we have today, your infantrymen. Okay, and the inf inf infantry are the guys that go down on the field and do what? They're, they're doing the hand-to-hand. -hand. Man, they're grinding it on the field. So Goliath, if you look at Goliath, Goliath, Goliath was an infantryman, right? He came to do battle with a sword and a spear and a shield, which is what you did as an infantryman. David was what back in that time was known as a slinger. Now, David was a shepherd, and he, he tended the sheep. Right. But he as a, as his his weapon of choice was to fight bears and lions and things like this. As a matter of fact, he said it. You know, I killed bears and lions. Right. Uh, he was a slinger. 
And that was actually a term used back then because in the military, there was a group that were archers, but there was also a group called slingers, right? And that was a weapon of choice back then, the, the sling was. So, the, so as, as this gentleman is going through the book, he's saying, here was the problem. You had Goliath who came down, right, as an infantryman, right? Big, strong guy, sword, shield, spear. And he was going up against who? A guy that was a, a slinger. He said, it's like bringing a knife to a, a, a gunfight. As a matter of fact, he said these slingers were so good. And he said it was apparent that David was a very good slinger because he talked about his battles over bears and lions and things like this out there tending his sheep. He said he was an expert slinger. Now, they had done research on these guys that could sling stones back then. And they said a, a slinger that was really good could throw a rock at about the same velocity of a, as a 45 caliber shell coming out of a gun. So he said, if you were hit with a rock from a slinger that was a good slinger, he said, it'd be like getting hit with a 45 caliber shell. As a matter of fact, he said, in the, mili in the military back there, they had weapon or tools designed to take these stones out of people. They would penetrate the skin of their enemies so bad. So he said, the, the real story about this is that David didn't go down to take on Goliath on Goliath's turf, right? What he did was say, look, I don't know anything about being an infantry one, but I'm pretty good with a what? A sling. And I tell people, and that's kind of the analogy that I want to use as we look at box stores and internet. I think a lot of my dealers think, you know, how do we be, how do we take on the box stores? How do we take on the internet? I said, you know, you're not going to be successful competing against the Lowe's, a Home Depot, you know, a Jack Small Engine, uh, Tractor Supply by, by fighting on their ground, you know, because we're not going to ever do what they do. What we have to do is find a way to let them be the infantryman and us be the slinger back here. Because David's advantage was he was small, agile, and a master at killing at a distance with a sling. So if you're an infantryman, right, you, you've got to be so close to use the sword. David just did what? You know, if I stand away from you, your sword has no value to me. I, I can throw a rock and hit you in the head. The other thing he talked about Goliath was is Goliath was a giant. And if you go back and study giantism, uh, giants tend to, tend to have people that are giants like uh, Goliath probably was. Uh, he, they have a, a, a very uh, bad eyesight normally because they grow so fast and their optic nerves can't keep up. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, uh, and you look in the Bible, he said Goliath came down and he had a servant bringing down his shield, most likely because the servant was there to guide Goliath down. Once he got close enough, he could see, but at, at a distance, he couldn't see what was going on. And so, because he made a reference that uh, he said, David said, you know, you came down with two sticks and you're going to try to beat me like a dog. And actually David had one. He said he, he wasn't even aware of his surroundings. So probably by the time he realized that he was coming up against a slinger, he didn't have time to prepare himself for, for battle. And so I want us to kind of think about it in that context. Not that David was an underdog, because was David an underdog? David brought a gun to a what? Knife fight. You're not an underdog either. And I tell my dealers, you have things that you bring to the table that these big stores and the Internet can't bring. You've got to accentuate those things. So I want to talk about that things. So when I look at the box stores and the Internet and I say, OK, well, what do they really bring to the table? This goes back again is, you know, what's an infantryman bring? Well, he's got a sword. He's got a shield. Right. He's got a spear. Those are his tools. Well, when you look at the box stores and the Internet, what does the box stores bring? Price. Are we going to beat the box stores on prices if they choose to compete against us? No, we're not going to beat them against price, right? So there's no reason for us to think that, well, what we got to do is compete with them on price. Are you ever going to be able to compete with a Home Depot, a Lowe's, or a tractor supplier, or even a Jack's on price? All right, so, so let's don't go to a, let's don't go to their knife fight, right? So price is not something we're going to be able to compete on. And maybe you can on a, on a one-off basis, but we're not in business to lower our price because I just said in the beginning, what are we here for? To make money. And, we, and if we lower our price, we make less what? Money. I'm trying to get all my dealers, keep moving your margins up, keep stretching your margins up there. Our goal is to get our margins up so we're making good money. <coughs> I tell people, you've got to quit being a dealer just to, to make a living. I tell people, if all you want to do as a dealer is make a living, dear Lord, go to a McDonald's, go work at a Burger King, join up with a Walmart. You can make a living, you just won't make what? Money. I tell people again, so, you know, if we're going to be in this thing, let's be in it to make money. And we're not going to make money by lowering our prices and trying to compete on prices. The other thing is brand names. What kind of brand names do they have? Same as you have, right? If it's a, if it's a branded product. I mean, they've got deer, they've got cub, they've got Husqvarna, they've got Echo. You name it. If it's a branded product, they've got it. So they've got access to the same brands that most of you guys have access to, right? Do they buy them in bigger quantities than you? Now, I know all your manufacturers swear on the Bible that they don't get better pricing, 
Wrong. We're all aware of that, right? All right, you can tell me all day long they don't get better pricing. That ain't true. You know that's not true. Do they have better, they have better return policies than you do? Are they required to set anything up and even make sure it runs? No. And when it needs service, where does it come? Oh, that's right, you're the servicing dealer. That's right, right. So I tell people again, so it's all BS, right? We know it is, we're all dealers, we're out there, so it's, it's not true. So we're not, we're not gonna play on the same ground that they play on. We're not gonna do that. What kind of assortment do they have? They have a bigger assortment than we're probably gonna have. And what kind of operating expenses do they have? Do they have lower operating overhead than you do? Absolutely, and why is their operating expenses lower? Because what all, what all do they handle in their store that you don't handle? Right, so they handle all these different products. They handle lumber, they handle all these different things, plumbing and things like this. So their cost of doing business is lower than your cost that's ever gonna be of doing business. You are not gonna compete against these people if you decide to go head to head with them. You're gonna lose every time. But then I go back and I think about the dealerships that I work with that do compete with them against success successfully. I think, okay, well about you, what have you got that's different? Here's some of the dealers that I work with. Scott's Power, I don't think, I know Scott's here, but he's not in the meeting. I think he had another meeting to go to. But Scott's Power Equipment, Scott's over in St. Louis. He's got four stores over there getting ready to add another store right across from a, a Home Depot. And we were laughing, he bought a car dealership and he's getting ready to open up a, a big store right across from a Home Depot. And when he called me up here a couple years ago, he goes, what do you think about this? I go, it's perfect. Why would it be good to open up across from a Home Depot? Well, there, what do we have that we want in business? Traffic, who brings traffic in? Right, the big store. So I tell people, so let them bring them in. If we're over here, then we can showcase what we do because I still believe most people would prefer to buy from a dealership if they can. 15% of the people are price buyers. We're never gonna get those people. 85% of the people, as we're gonna learn in the moment, will spend more to do business with you if you show them that you are worth more. Right, so again, I want the traffic. So I said it's over there. Clay, Jerry Clay down in North Carolina. And so these are some of the guys we work with that compete successfully day in and day out. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Landon Coates up in the Virginia Beach area. They've got seven stores up there, right? And they compete day in and day out with these big box stores and win, not on price, but because what they do is different. Number one is they have a very strong customer service, customer care attitude. Their job, again, is not to have satisfied customers. Do we want satisfied customers in our dealerships? Is satisfied customers, are, what, are that what we're striving for in our dealerships? No, we don't want satisfied customers. I don't want customers that are satisfied. I don't want to spend any time, energy, or effort to try to take customers and make them satisfied. That's one of the biggest fallacies that's been perpetrated on small businesses that your goal is to have satisfied customers. That is not your goal. You don't want satisfied customers, why? Why would you not want satisfied customers? There you go, because satisfied customers are satisfied for now, but something else can make them satisfied someplace else. What kind of customers do you want again? Loyal customers. I tell people, you spend your time and energy trying to make people satisfied, and you don't spend much of your time at all, much of your dollars at all, taking customers that already do business with you and making them loyal to you. Is there a difference between a loyal customer and a satisfied customer? Is there a difference between satisfied and loyal? I tell people, if you're married, ask your spouse. Find out. There's a difference. There's a difference, right? What we want to do is spend our time and energy making people loyal. How do you make people loyal? And what are loyal people? Why are they more valuable than satisfied customers? Because loyal people, do they beat you up on price? How many people in here right now have customers that do business with you that never ask about the price? They just walk up and say, Larry, this is what I'm needing. What do you think I ought to buy? How many people have customers like that? Okay, and, and they, don't, they don't talk about price, do they, Larry? They don't say how much is it. They just come up to you because they trust you and they come up to you and say, here's what I need, I think. What do you think I ought to buy? Right, and then they say, well, and then you say, well, this is what I would, if I were you, this is what I would buy. And they go, okay, and then their next question is not how much is it. Their next question is, is there any chance you can deliver it by Saturday? They never even brought up the price because they what? They're loyal to you and they, they trust you. That's what it's all about. So how do we take people and make them trust us? How do we take people and make them like this? Well, we have to do things for them that other people refuse to do. Anybody ever heard of thank you notes? Anybody have a grandmother or a mother that ever told you the importance of sending out thank you notes? How many people in here know that thank you notes are important? Okay, now why would a thank you note be important? Well, number one, nobody sends them out. So they have value. 
right? And I tell all of my owners every day, you should find somebody that comes into your dealership and walks in that you didn't get a chance to talk to. And I want you to send them a note and says, you know, guys, I saw you in yesterday, Duff, but I didn't get a chance to thank you for being a customer. I just wanted you to know how much I appreciate you being one of our customers. I wish everyone was like you. Thanks again, Bob, or successfully Bob. And send that one of those out a day. How many people in here, if you just sent one thank you note out a day to a customer, right, that you didn't get a chance to talk to, but you sent it out to them and they got a handwritten thank you note in the mail from you, what kind of impact would that have on one of your customers? It would be amazing what would happen. Oh, and then they're so expensive. That's the trouble with thank you notes because they cost, I don't know what, 39 cents for a stamp, right? And you probably have a buck in one, a total of dollar. What kind of impact would a dollar or a dollar and a half have on one of your customers? And you know what loyal customers do that satisfied customers don't do? They talk. Loyal customers talk. If somebody says, oh, gosh, where do you buy from? A satisfied customer says, well, you know, I've been buying over there for a while. But I also see that this company over there has. They're satisfied with you, but they don't do something that loyal customers do. What do loyal customers do for you that satisfied customers tend not to do? They tell other people what? They tell other people about you. They go to bat for you. If somebody says, well, I had a bad experience. Well, I've been doing business with Hills Power Pro over there for 20 years. I've never had a bad experience at all. Never had a bad experience. They will fight your battles for you. That's why I tell people, that's what we want to do. How much time are you spending building loyal customers? None. You're just not. Because you've been, you've been led to believe that it's not loyal that you're looking for. It's satisfied. I don't want satisfied. I don't want satisfied. I want to take half of my customer base and make them what? Right now, about 25% of your customer base is what you would consider loyal. They'll do whatever you ask to do. What would happen if half of all the customers that walked into your dealership were loyal? What would happen to your numbers? What would happen to your margins? What would happen to your, your attitudes inside of your stores? Those guys up there all work hard. All work hard on creating loyal customers. So one of the things we can do real quickly and easily is start doing what every day? One a day. Just a thank you note. Just a thank you note. It doesn't have to be anything great. Handwritten thank you note. Go get some paper printed. I try to send out five a day when I'm out speaking. When I go back to the hotel tonight, I have thank you notes in my briefcase and stamps and envelopes. And I try to send out five a day when I'm out speaking. Five people a day that I've touched in some way or that's touched me, I send them a thank you note. Hey, it was great to talk to you at the meeting. It was great to talk to you about this. Hope things are doing good. If I can ever help you, do this. And I always take and put my card in there and I write thanks and their name on my business card. Why would I write thanks and their name on my business card? Because what will they do if they have their name is on your card? Will they throw your card away? No. They keep the card. Thanks and their name on the business card. Customer care. Product knowledge. How many people have ever gone to a Lowe's or a Home Depot and asked a serious question about anything? Now, I'm not disparaging Home Depot and Lowe's or Tractor Supplies people, but they know nothing. I mean, you know, if you want to be frustrated, go there and ask somebody that's by lawnmowers a question because most likely they were just in plumbing. And they go, well, gosh, what do you think about this? Oh, it's a great piece of equipment. Well, why do you think it's great? Well, uh, uh, it's just here. It's great. They don't know anything about it. What's the one thing that you guys know? Product knowledge. And if you don't know it, then you need to be well-versed in why should people buy a piece, particular piece of equipment? Why should you buy it from me? And again, I'm not knocking Home Depot and Lowe's and Tractor Supply people. They just don't know anything about what they sell. Would you all agree? They don't have any clue. They don't have any clue. It's just out there, right? And if it's out there, then it must be good. They don't know why it's good. They don't even know if it's right. How many people have ever seen somebody buy a machine at a tractor supply, a Lowe's or a Home Depot that was, I don't know, they probably spent close to $1,400 on it, a tractor, and they're going out and they're mowing 20 acres with it of tall, wet grass. And they bring it into you, of course, because it what? It won't, it broke down. And then, of course, they took it back to Lowe's or Home Depot and says, oh, well, they're, they're the servicing dealer. Don't worry, they'll warranty it for you. <laughs> yeah, right? Ever heard that before? Uh, you know what? No, we won't. <laughs> I tell all my dealers, you know what? Send it back to Lowe's. Tell them to take it back to Lowe's and ask Lowe's to give them another one. You know, if you want to break these guys, quit doing all this warranty work for them. Tell them that, you know what? It's not under, going to be under warranty. I guarantee it's not going to be under warranty. Now, if it's under warranty, you have an obligation as a representative of the manufacturer to do it. But you guys know as well as I do, a lot of this stuff comes in from these box stores. You know, they didn't know that it needed oil. 
Didn't know that. You know that cord of stuff that's hanging on the handle that you never put in? Should have put it in. Should have put it in. So I tell people again, if you know for a fact that it's not going to be covered by warranty, don't waste your time saying, well, let me see if we can get it covered. It's not your responsibility to try to get a customer that didn't buy from you help under warranty. Now, if they bought it from you and they were stupid, then you're trying to, going to try to do what? You're going to try to help them. But I tell people, send them back. Say, you know what? I know Lowe's sent you here, but you know what? This isn't going to be warranty. What you really need to do is just go back to Lowe's and tell them you want your money back. Because you know what Lowe's and Home Depot will do and Tractor Supply? You know what they do? Because their whole business is about making people what loyal or satisfied. Satisfied. And so we're going to do what? We're going to jam that stuff back down their throat. And as we jam it back down their throat, who's going to have to eat it? Who's going to eat it? The manufacturers, right? Because the manufacturers are going to do everything they can to take care of their little babies out there, right? And so they're going to have to eat it. And after a while, what will they quit doing? You guys, you, all you guys do is, is help the manufacturers sell through box stores because you're willing to do what? You're willing to do and lift a heavy load to take care of the crap that they put in out there. I tell people to drive it back to them. Now, if it's under warranty, bring it in. But if it's not, and you know it's not going to be under warranty, say, you know what you need to do? This is not going to be under warranty. What you really need to do is just go back to Lowe's and tell them that you're not happy with this. And I guarantee you they're going to do what? They're either going to give you another mower or they're going to do what? Yeah, you want to what? You want to get them out of that business? Make it start costing them a lot more money. You're making it cost them. All you're doing by doing all this stuff and trying to help these guys out, all you're doing is keeping them in business longer. Drive it back, jam it down their throats in a nice Christian sort of way. OK, uh, but don't do this stuff. You guys kill me when you do this stuff because you guys are so intent on taking care of everybody. They didn't buy from you. And you say, yeah, but Bob, they're my customer. No, they're not your customer. They didn't buy from you. Right. Spend your time and energy and effort on the people that did do what? Buy from you. And let's spend more time to make them more loyal so they'll tell more people so we'll get more of who in. Does it make sense? Right. I know you guys have a passion for some of your vendors out there, but these guys almost to a fault, do everything they can. They tell you how important you are as dealers. They preach it to you all the time. And you guys just sit there and suck it down and think it's true. It's not true. We've got to take a stronger stance here as dealers if we're going to be in this business. Your ability to customize is something you can do. If somebody comes in and has some unique situations or whatever, what can you do in your dealership form? You can build things, help them do things and do things. So customization is something that they can't do at a box store, a tractor supply, a jack small engine. Fun and authentic. And I tell people there's not a dealership up there if you walked in you would not have a good experience in. You know, one of the things I tell my dealers is you've got to have more fun in your dealership. You've got to be a place when people walk in to your dealership feel like they have come home. Now, I'm going to talk about this in one of my workshops a little bit later on this week. But I tell people again, I'm going to talk about it because I can't emphasize it enough. People want to feel like they've come home. One of the most important things you can do in your dealership is not have your dealership look like a dealership. You've got to have people walk into your dealership and feel like they've come someplace that's unique and special. What do we all want? We all want security. Would you agree? Everybody that comes into your dealership wants to feel secure. People give you money when, when, when you make them feel secure. Would you agree? I mean, there's only been one time in our life where we've been absolutely, totally secure. Does anybody remember when it was? One time in your life you were absolutely, totally secure. You wanted for nothing. Does anybody know when it was? It's for about nine months. Does this narrow it down to any for you people? <laughs> nine months in our life, we had a pretty good deal going on. At nine months in our life, when we were in our mother's womb, did we have a pretty good deal going on? I want you to think about this. I mean, we had a nine-month lease on an apartment that just wouldn't quit, right? I mean, so here we are. We're in our mother's womb. Things are going good for us. I mean, look at this. We're plugged into a refrigerator we never have to stock, right? Right? Temperature's controlled, so we're never too hot or too cold, right? Don't owe anybody any money yet. Government's not looking out for us, right? We're, things are going good, right? Didn't have to worry about what you wear that day, right? Have your own pool. Huh? Is this a good deal? Things are great. Man, you're in here. Yeah, you feel totally secure. It doesn't get any better than that. You are plugged into the perfect place. About nine months into this deal, you get an eviction notice. You don't know who it is, but somebody's telling you it's time to do what? It's time to leave. You don't want to go. But all of a sudden, man, you feel the evictor pushing you out. You get closer and closer to the door. And you start hearing people that you've never heard before. You start hearing a woman that you're going to later learn to call mom say something to a man you're going to later learn to call dad. Something like this. If you ever touch me again, I'll kill you. Something like that. And all of a sudden, many of you turned around and went back. You were called breach. So all of a sudden, you go back. But unfortunately, a victor is strong and you finally end up where? Out in the hands of a 
professional outdoor power equipment dealer or a doctor. <laughs> right? And so now at this point, you're out of this secure situation. And what's the first thing the doctor do, does? They hit you. <clears throat> right? And then once they hit you, they do what? They cut the cut. Cord, which severs your sense of security. And from that moment to the day that you die, you're going to be walking around with an invisible cord going, you look like mom. You look like mom. Everybody wants to plug back into who? Mom, when I tell my dealers what we want to do is we want to have a place when people come into our dealership that they feel like they've come home. I want them to plug in. I want them to feel like they can come in and not be asked, a, not ask a stupid question. Drives me nuts when parts people say, well, if you don't have your model make and talk, I can't help you out. I can get that at the Home Depot Lowe's, right? I can do that. I can get it there. That's not what we want to do here. Somebody comes up and they don't know our primary responsibility. If they walk in our stores to do what? Try to help them feel like they're smart. And you have very dumb customers. So this is a challenge in and of itself. <laughs> How many people in here feel like you have people that are really, really, really should not be allowed to buy things with sharp spinning metal blades on them? <laughs> all right. All right. All right, so you know what I'm talking about here, right? So to make them feel smart is quite a task in and of itself, right? Because when they come in, they say, I need a blade for my mower. Well, what kind of mower is it? I don't know. They go, but it's red. Well, that narrowed it down. There's only 90% of them are that color, right? I tell people again, but our job is to make them feel like they've come where? Home. They've come home. My dealers today now are making hot chocolate chip cookies and they're cooking popcorn. Anybody here do hot chocolate chip cookies? You want to make people feel like they've come home? Go get you a cheap toaster oven. Go to a store and get bulk cookie dough, hot chocolate cookie dough. And all day long, just make hot chocolate chip cookies inside of your store. When people walk into my dealerships that do that, I tell people it's just funny to watch them because they come in, they got this. And the moment they walk in the door, what's the first thing you smell? Rubber, oil, grease, fuel. No, what's the first thing you smell? Hot chocolate chip cookies. You know what people do? Oh, you guys making cookies? Yeah, want one? Love one. You want some milk? I got a dealer in Bull Bowling Green, Kentucky. You want milk? You want uh, pop? You want water? Free. Because I tell people again, we take our marketing money. I'm going to talk about advertising and marketing tomorrow. But we take some of our money and we put toward those things. Right? I don't spend more money, but when you come into my dealership, I want you to feel like you've come where? Home. Because you're not going to feel that way at a Home Depot Lowe's, right? It goes back to that fun, authentic. Balloons, make your store fun. Have things going on inside that's fun. Go get a gumball machine. Uh, and I tell people again, you know, I got a granddaughter. Her name is Annalise. She's about five years old. I've got my daughter, Sarah, who works with me too. She's got two 18-month-olds. But as a grandparent, how many people in here are grandparents? You take a grandchild by a machine that requires a quarter that they can get gum or a tattoo or a sticker out of, what will you do? <laughs> you will go do it. So I tell people, just go buy yourself at a Sam's Club or whatever, a, a little gumball machine <coughs> and, and go get yourself like a roll of quarters and go. And every time a child walks in your store with a grandparent or parent, the first thing I want you to do is ignore the parent and ignore the grandparent. Walk up to the child and give them a what? A quarter and say, look, go get yourself a what? A sticker or whatever it is. Just go get it. I was talking to a guy the other day and he says, well, you'll go through a lot of money. I said, you've got a key to the machine. You can get your quarters back. <laughs> he goes, oh. And, and how many dealerships do you have there, sir? Okay. I said, you can get your money back. All right. But I tell people again, but it makes it a place that it's what? So all of a sudden now the parents not looking at a mower. They're not looking at this. They're not looking at this. They're doing what? They've had, you're, you've made their child or grandchild have a what? A unique I'm home experience. That's what it's about. And I tell people that's how we're going to win because we're going to do those types of things. Does it cost much? No. We get so focused on spending all this big money on stuff. It's easy. It's inexpensive to have this kind of experience happen there. Then the other thing you have is service and or parts. And I tell people again, that's the one thing that you guys, again, you give away your service to these guys that come in and they bought the machine at a Lowe's or a Home Depot or a tractor supply or off the guy on the Internet. Now that says, don't worry, your servicing dealer will take care of it. I don't don't think so. Send it back to them. Send it back to them. I'm not there to take care of your work. You want to go sell it cheaper? You want to come into my territory and sell it? Then you're going to eat it. Somehow you're going to send it back, right? I don't have to do that. If it's not under warranty, now if it's under warranty, you're required by contract to do what? It's a, but how many of these things that come in are really warranty issues? Everybody believes that everything on a new piece of equipment is what? 
warranty. It's, there's not. It has to be a manufacturer defect. So I tell people again, we've got to do a better job of letting people know that we have the service and or the parts that they can't get someplace else. So that's a big piece of it. The other thing, again, is build it on trust. And I tell people relationships are built on trust and businesses are built on relationships. We are in a relational business. Home Depot, Lowe's, Tractor Supply, they're not in the relational business. They're in a transactional business. They're just there to turn people through. What are you doing as a dealer to build trust? What are you doing? I tell people again, we don't have to do it with everybody, but we got to start taking the people that already trust us, and then we're going to start taking some of our satisfied customers, and we're going to start doing what? Working to build trust with them. And if you took half of the people that right now are satisfied and turned them into loyal, what would that do to your business? It's enormous. It is enormous of what would take place there. So you build the trust. Add value. 85% of the people will pay more if they perceive you bring more to the table than your competitor. What are you doing to add value? for what you do. Now, if you go back over to our showroom little area over there, I tried to set up a small little mini showroom, but I tell people again, add value. When you buy a piece of equipment from my dealership, your dealership, what is it that you bring to the table that Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, Tractor Supply, Orslands, these other places, what are they not gonna bring? They're gonna teach you how to use the equipment properly. They're gonna go over anything on the equipment. They're just gonna do what? They're gonna sell it to you. They're gonna go on chain the cable out in front of the store and they may or may not even help you push it on your trailer if it happens to have a tire that's not flat on it or a battery that's dead. You're going to be able to go back and say, look, you know, when you buy from me, and yes, we are a little bit more expensive. And I tell people again, never tell people, don't be ashamed of the fact that you're a little bit more expensive. Use that as a, as a bragging right. We are a little bit more. Yes, you are going to spend another $100, another $200 to buy it from me, but here's what you get. Number one, you get to be what we call a preferred customer. Now, what's a preferred customer? Well, in our dealerships, a preferred customer is somebody that bought from us, right, that has status that a customer doesn't have. So we have two types of customers in our dealerships. We have customers, and a customer is somebody who wants us to do service on their equipment but didn't buy the equipment from us. They pay our posted labor rate. Right? So if your posted labor rate now is at $75, you need to move your posted labor rate up $10 an hour. I don't care where it's at right now, move it up $10 an hour because your manufacturers are going to pay that rate for you to do their warranty work because they're, they're a customer, but they're not a preferred customer. A preferred customer is somebody who bought the equipment from us. So if you're a customer, you're going to pay $10 more an hour. So my labor rate is $10 more than what it is right now. David, what's your labor rate right now? 75, so you go to 85. Now, if I bought it from you, what rate would I pay? 75. Okay, so now when you come in and you say, well, why should I spend $100 more to buy from you? I say, well, number one is you become a preferred customer. And they go, well, well what's that mean? Oh, well, it means you get a $10 discount on all of our labor. And why did I give them a $10 discount? Oh, that's right, I did what to it? I raised it $10. So they pay basically what they're paying now. People that didn't buy from me, what rate do they pay? $10 more. Manufacturers pay $10 more. You get a 5% discount on all your parts. Oh, by the way, you should be adding 5% to all the parts you sell your own shop. And we're going to talk about that two days from now when I talk about how to improve your margins. And if after this program, I'll share with you, if you want to, I'll share with you why. But if not, come to my program on how to improve your margins. All your parts that you sell your own service department should be 5% higher than what they can buy at the parts counter because it costs you more to sell parts to yourself in, in a way that you don't think about, but I'll share that with you. The nice thing you got with Ideal out there, their software can actually do it very easily for you. That's why we like Ideal as one of our, of our preferred vendors in software, because it's easy to do. Doesn't seem like much, but if you're doing $200,000 a year in parts sales through your shop, an extra 5% brings you $10,000 of net profit into your bottom line. How many people would like to have an extra $10,000 of net profit? What would you, I know what you guys would do with it. You'd just go out and buy another right, bike with it or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with that, Nathan. Nothing wrong. All right. But I go back again, but that's what you're trying to do. So we give a discount, a 5% discount if you're a preferred customer. Does anybody have like a, a shopper card or anything that you go to a store and buy from? You give them a little card. That's all a preferred customer is. Go, to, go on the internet, get a preferred customer card and give it to people that buy from you and say, this is what you get with that. As a preferred customer, what status do you have in my service department? Well, guys, if Duff is a preferred customer and I'm not, and my machine's just getting ready to go into the shop to have it serviced, and all of a sudden Duff brings his in that morning, but they're getting ready to put mine in at 10 o'clock, mine's going in, and Duff comes in at 8 o'clock and drops his off, who gets in front of mine? Duff automatically, even though it just got there an hour ago, it does what? If there's an opening and there's a customer there and a preferred customer comes in, that customer goes back a notch because my preferred customer always gets what? Always gets 
preferred service. That makes sense? So people say, and I tell people that when you're selling them, I say, you know, you can save $200 if you want to go buy it. I'm sure you can get $200 off. Matter of fact, if you go 40 miles from here, you can probably get $300 off. You know, and we'll still want to service it for you, but we serve it for you as a customer, not a preferred customer. And then they'll say, well, what's a preferred customer? And you go, well, I'm glad you asked. And I can show you what you get as a preferred customer. And I says, now, over the life of that machine, right, that $300 is insignificant because you're going to more than get that back by being one of our, our preferred customers. I was at a dealership the other day and the guy goes, well, it's not fair. If mine was in line before his was in line, I said, you should go ahead and service mine. I go, you know, it's not fair, is it? But unfortunately, that's the way it is. Life's not what, Duff? Fair. If you want to be a preferred customer, then yours would stay where? Right there. But if you want to go buy it someplace else, I still want to service it because do we want to do their work? Absolutely, because we want to sell, we sell time in a shop. I don't care who I sell it to. But my preferred customers always get, always go to the front of the line. Always go to the front of the line. All right. So again, that's the kind of value that you want to add to your dealership. Dare to be different. I tell people, people will spend money on people and things that are unique and different. I have two pictures up there. The one is a Picasso. The other is one of my favorites, dogs playing poker. Okay, so I really prefer the dogs playing poker picture. But if you were to look at those two pictures up there, which of those, if you had the actual picture itself, would be more valuable? The dogs playing poker or the Picasso? Not which do you like better? Okay, Picasso. Why is Picasso more valuable than dogs playing poker? Well, because there's a limited number of Picassos because he is dead. Okay, so the more unique something is, the more value it has. Would you agree? The more unique a thing is, the more value it has. Okay, now I want you to think about your dealership for a second. How unique are you as a dealer? If I walked into your dealership and then I walked and I went into another dealership 20 or 30 minutes from you and walked into theirs, would I truly find anything in my mind as a consumer that would separate you from them? Or are you just another dealer doing what other dealers do? I tell my dealers again, if you want to be successful, it's creating the uniqueness. How much more will people pay for something that's unique, different, one of a kind? Why would a vase from the Ming Dynasty of China be more expensive than a vase from a Walmart, Target, or Kmart? They all come from China. <laughs> right? So why would it be more expensive? I would venture to say the Walmart, Target, or Kmart vase is, more, more, is better quality than the 4,000-year-old vase. But what makes the 4,000-year-old vase more expensive is the fact that there's not many what? 4,000-year-old vases. It's the uniqueness of it that creates its value. And I tell my dealers, the thing that you've got to stop doing is going around to every other dealer around you and trying to be a mirror image of them. That's the last thing you want to do. Your goal as a dealer is to do what? Create a, a uniqueness that another, nobody else can can introduce into their dealership. Do things in your store that's different. Have a different look. Set yourself up different. In the showroom, and I've got a little display over there with some Husqvarna tractors in it, but I tell guys again, a showroom is not an extension of your warehouse, and most of your showrooms are nothing but an extension of your warehouse. You just got as much crap packed in it as you can. Right? Your showroom is a showcase, just like a car dealership. So when I walk into your store, I don't want to see lots of equipment. I want to see a few select pieces that have everything that I could possibly get on them. Because you think about a car dealership, what do they do in a car dealership showroom? Have every model there? No, they have what? A few models, and, and what do the models have on them? Stripped down to the bare bones? They've got what? It may be a Chevy Geo for $12,000, but the one on the showroom floor is $18,000 because it's got what on it? If it can be put on it, it has it on it because we know in sales, you'll make more money selling down than you ever will selling up. Make sense? So I tell people again, that sets you apart. I want them to be able to get on the equipment. I want them to be able to set on it. I want to encourage them to get on the equipment. Take the signs off that says, please don't set on this. I tell people, dear Lord, if your equipment can't handle a five-year-old, why would I want to buy it? <laughs> right? I mean, I've seen people set the little mantis tillers and the seats of zero turns on cardboard to keep people off of them. I was in a dealership a while back. And I go, well, that's a unique way to display those mantis tillers. He goes, well, it keeps people off of them. Right? I said, I know this brand, this brand, it can handle a five-year-old. Let him get on it. I want the five-year-old to get on it, jump up and down on it, get it dirty. What we will do that night? We can clean it. Right? Let people experience it. Don't keep them from it. You want them to do what? Touch it. Get on and experience it. So those are the things we have to do to be different. Set yourself up to negotiate. Just don't use cash. Now, I tell people today, one of the things that I hear dealers say is, you know what? I'm not going to negotiate. I tell people, everybody today expects you to do what? Negotiate. Don't be afraid to negotiate. Just don't use cash to do it with. 
right? What's cash cost you? 100% of its value. So a dollar costs me how much? A dollar. What's a dollar's worth of service cost you? One of the shops I consult with, about 50 cents. What's a dollar's worth of parts cost you? Again, at the dealerships that I work with in Outdoor Power, that dollar's worth of parts cost you maybe anywhere between 52 and maybe 47 cents of dollars. So when I negotiate, what I want to do is have things pre-set up to negotiate with. Right? I want to have things pre-set up. So we know what a full service on a garden tractor would cost. Most of my dealerships on a full service on a garden tractor, it's going to run about two hours, two and a half hours, somewhere in there. And it's going to run in the neighborhood of $250 to $275 for a full service. Okay, so if I know it's going to say, let's say it's going to run $300. I'll just make it nice and simple. So full service is say for that garden tractor that you're looking at is $300. You want me to knock $100 off of this tractor. What I will do is give you a what? $100 off of your first full what? Full service because I make how much on a full service? Well, if it costs me three, if I sell it for $300 and I'm at 50% margin on it, it costs me $150. So if I knock $100 off a of $300 service, I still made what? $50. And what do they have to do to get that service? They've got it. Well, they got to buy the machine, but they have to do what? They come back. Now, if they choose not to come back, then I don't have to perform on the what? And so how much did I negotiate away? Uh, that would be zero. How do my margins hold up then? Really good. It's like I tell people with chainsaws. It drives me nuts. People come in and say, hey, I'll buy that chainsaw if you'll throw in a what? A chain. We're not going to throw in a chain. Now, we know we make a ton of money on chain. Would you all agree? Chain is a high margin item. But I tell people, if you just give them a chain then, right, they don't have to come back. So I say, why not have a card that print, that's, you print up and say, look, you know, I'll give you a card for a free chain when you bring this old one back in to have it what? Sharpen, but now don't lose that card because the only way I know you get a free chain is that what? And let's hope they lose that what? <laughs> right? Now, how many people in here has ever gotten a gift card before and then lost it? There's a lot of stores out there that count on you doing what? Because when you go back into a Lowe's and say, you know, I got a hundred dollar gift card for Christmas, but I lost it. I need my money. They're going to go, you know, we just don't do it that way. Because I don't know that you actually have that. And so I tell people again, and, and if they want the chain then, I tell people, I'm not going to fight you. I'm still going to give you the chain then. But you'll be amazed. Most people say, oh, that'd be great. So they got their chain, which they wanted as a part of the negotiation. You made money on it. But what you also required them to do to get that chain was to do what? Come back in your store. Now, when they come back in the store to get the chain sharpened, I'm going to make hopefully a little bit of money on the sharpening. But I also have the ability in my store to sell you what? Oil, bar oil, other types of things. If you just give them the chain, they don't have to do what? They don't have to come back. Does it make sense? So I tell people again, don't be afraid to negotiate. Just don't use cash as a negotiation tool. Use other types of things. Now the perk again with that dealer toolbox, and I think if you don't have the card, get your card, check off that. Let me send you the link to that dealer toolbox. I have all of your basic services already set up in a spreadsheet. The time for every piece of equipment you're going to service in an outdoor power equipment dealership's there. Everything from generators to pressure washers. If you service it, it's in there. It's real time in a real shop. I even have the parts listed for it. It's in an Excel spreadsheet. All you have to do is put your, new, your labor rate in one of the boxes where it says posted labor rate and it'll automatically change all the pricing to match what your pricing would be. The parts are priced out at about a 50% average gross profit margin. If you're lower than that, you may want to go back and tweak your prices down. It's all there. It's all there. So there, is there any excuse now for you guys not to negotiate using services? Because who, who, you have all the information there. So I tell people again, pricing, set yourself up to negotiate, just don't use cash. Deploy strategic online marketing program, and again, you got to have a website, people. How many people have a website that you are proud of? How many people have a website? Okay, how many people are not sure the internet's going to be around and once Al Gore goes, it'll all be over anyway? <laughs> so websites will go along with global warming, right? So it'll be done. Okay, if you don't have a website, would you please do me a favor? ARI's right out there. Go out and talk to ARI about having them work with you to get a website set up. Folks, today, most everybody does what? Before they go out and buy anything, what do most people do? 
they go online and search. I'm 60 years old. I go online and search. I'm not looking to buy it online. I buy from dealers. I buy from people locally. But I like to search online to get knowledge and gain information. And then when I find what I want, I go type in where it says dealer locator. What do I do? I put my zip code in, and it's going to give me two or three places I can do what? Go buy a product. And what's the next thing I do? I click on their what? Their websites. And your website gives me a picture of what I perceive you're going to be. And it may not be accurate. You may have, you know, the little steel thing. If you're a steel dealer, you got their little website up. It doesn't do you any good, right? Because you're just, it's a little thing. It doesn't tell me anything about you. I want a picture of who on your website. Who's, what's the first thing that should be on your website? The most important thing in your whole dealership. And it should be on the first page of your website. It should be what? You. What do people buy? People don't buy products and services. They buy what? People, show me a picture of you. Show me a picture of your team. That's what I want to see. This is the people I'm going to deal with. When I walk in, I want to be able to identify you. I don't care about your brands. I've already decided I want the brand because how did I get to you? I went to, I went to the brand, clicked on the dealer locator. So the brand doesn't have that value to me anymore. I can connect through you the other way. I want to see you there. Take me to your parts department and show me your people behind the parts counter. Show me some pictures of your parts department. Clean it up first, but show me those pictures. <laughs> Take me back to the shop on that one day once a year where it's actually clean and painted, right? Show me what I'm going to get here. Sell yourself. So again, have a good website. Run ads and promotions online. You guys, and is, has anybody done any Google advertising or any Facebook advertising? Well, I'm telling you guys, it's not expensive. And I'm going to do a program in a couple of days on marketing and advertising. And I'm going to get into this more. But if I was anybody here in an area where you get snow, where snow throwers are a part of what you do. All right. I guarantee you that it looks like we're probably going to have a heavier winter than we had last year. Everything's looking that way. So I tell all my dealers, so if we know we're going to have snow, and how many people have a Facebook page? Not a business one. I'm not a big fan of business Facebook pages. I don't think they do much good. Personal Facebook page. All right, so, so go on there, and you can go buy ads over on the right-hand side. So when you click on it, it knows your demographics and whatever. And so like on, on uh, Facebook, you can go over there, and you can go in and create an ad for snow. And so when people start talking and, and Facebooking about the snowstorm coming, guess whose ads pop up over here? Yours, right? Because those are tied to those key words on those pages there. It's inexpensive to do, and it gets you out there. Do you really want to be talking about snow throwers when it's not snowing? Because when do people really get excited about snow throwers and doing service on snow throwers? About, one, about 24 hours prior to the blizzard hitting, right? You guys know what that's like in a shop. So I tell people, do that. And then integrate your online presence with your social media program. And I just encourage you to do it. And again, you know, Husqvarna and Ideal and Lista, these are guys that are sponsoring everything that goes on here. And so again, if you don't have a website, just go talk to them. If you don't have business plan management software, you know, one of the things, again, I tell my people, your software is such an important part of it. Remember I talked about adding that 5% on? You want that as a part of your software program. You know, and again, if you're looking for it, and I'm and Julia's back in the backpack there, but Ideal is the only one, as far as I know, that can do it. You want it. You want that stuff in there. Integrate all those things together into your program and make that a big piece of what you're doing. And then the last thing that I want to share with you, and you guys have to do this, and I, this kills me to tell you this, because it's nice to buy things online from Amazon that I don't have to pay taxes on. But I'm telling you guys, just as me as a small business owner, you as a small business owner, we have to start getting a hold of our state representatives senators and representatives, and we've got to have them start pushing for a fair tax structure. It, it, you've got to get away from having these guys that sell parts and things like that on the internet. Now, I've got a lot of dealers that sell parts on the internet, so I'm not talking about that. But you've got places out there selling the equipment and stuff, and they can sell it, and they don't have to charge sales tax in most of your states. That's killing you. The fact that they can sell something and they can be 7 or 8 or sometimes 9% lower than you can just for the fact that the equipment's the same price, but they, they, didn't, they, didn't, get, they didn't have to pay what? Sales tax. And I tell people again, we're in brick and mortar stores. That's our business. And so as much as I hate to say this, it's to our advantage if the government would make it fair to everybody. We're brick and mortar stores. What do we have to collect every day on every sale we do? Sales tax. And, and, and a lot of you don't want to do this because you're like me, because you do buy things on the internet and it's a perk, not having to pay taxes on it. But I tell people, I got to take me out of it. You got to take you out of it. And there's a couple of acts out there, the Marketplace Equity Act and the Market, Marketplace Fairness Act. Get with your state and your, your state senators and your state representatives and say, look, we need to pass a law in our state. And some of you guys are already required, your, the internets are required to pay taxes in your state. 
But as much as I hate to tell you this, we've got it. We've got to even the playing field on this. Right. You got people out there that can compete against you. And their biggest the biggest fact that they can compete is people they can buy through them, but they don't have to pay what? And that seven or eight percent is a substantial amount. As you get some of these Yehis out there selling power equipment and bigger stuff online, that seven or eight percent is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. You have to pay it. Right. And there's absolutely no reason that if they're going to sell into your state and they're going to compete against you, it needs to be what? It needs to be fair. So I tell every one of my dealers, if you don't like it, you need to get with your state representative and your state senator and say, you know what? As much as I hate to do this, everybody, if we're going to play on the Internet and we're going to do commerce on the Internet, everybody should be required to do what? It's got to be a, it's got to be an even playing field. So I'd encourage you to do it. The other thing, and I, we talked about this a little bit. The other thing is I would really like for you guys as dealers to really push your state representatives and your state senators to create or fashion a law that requires manufacturers to pay posted labor rates. Almost every state, every state in the United States, if you're an ag dealer, a manufacturer does not have an option. They are required by state law to pay your posted labor rate. But most states have exempted outdoor power out of that. Power sports in it, outdoor power exempted out of it. And I would tell you guys again, your manufacturers, you got some guys out there that you sell stuff for and they're only paying you 45 or 50 bucks an hour for your, for your warranty labor rate. That is ridiculous, right? And, and so I would encourage you again to get with your state representative or your state senator. And, 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 and Florida's law is the best that I've seen out there. And have them go to Florida's law for dealers and dealer rights and have them fashion it after the state of Florida. And in, in Florida, if you're a dealer down there, they by law have to pay you your posted labor rate. Because you got dealers out there that won't pay it to you unless you reach certain levels of color, silver, bronze, or gold, or whatever, BS. Right, here's our labor rate. This is what you have to pay. And so again, so you need to be able to do those things. So I tell people again, you gotta get on top of that stuff. We gotta take a stronger stand as dealers out here and say, look, you know what? We're mad as hell and we're not gonna what? We're not going to take it anymore. It's time for us to step up. You guys are that group out there that make this whole thing happen. Manufacturers produce stuff. And the reality of it is, is they've got to have dealers, a strong dealer network out there to do it. And, and again, if they're not willing to build it, we've got to build it ourselves. And we've got to take on those stands out there. So I just encourage you to do that. Last thing, again, really quick, focus on your more personal service. Uh, make sure that you have good, strong product knowledge. Get to know the customers and make sure that what you do is convenient for them to do. Don't make, a, don't make it difficult for a customer to work with you. Make it simple. I tell my people, again, in dealerships, don't say no to people. Find out a way to say yes. If somebody comes in and wants something, your goal as an employee is not to figure out how to say no quickly. Your goal as an employee is to figure out how can we say what? How can we say yes? How can we say yes? Right? Don't think about saying no. How can we say less? I tell people at parts counter. Somebody comes in and says, I need a lawnmower blade, but I don't know the mic model or type on it. I said, then ask them a few questions. And if you think it's a Toro personal pace mower and you know they bought it maybe three years ago, you're a parts person. You know probably the most common blade for that. Send it with them. Send it with them. And say, you know what? When you take the one off, if it's not right, bring the one back and bring this one back and I'll do what? I'll swap it out for you, right? But don't say, well, come back with it. When you come back with it, I'll find the right one for you because they're not going to come back. Where are they going to go? To the what? The box store. They'll pick up one there. What will the box store? If it's not right, well, <laughs> what will the box store do? Right? I tell people, don't be crazy. Now, there's a few things I don't want them to take with them. I don't want them to take the wrong spark plug. Would you agree? Because we all know all spark plugs are the same, right? <laughs> right? I don't want them to take the wrong oil filter with them. Would you agree? All right, there's some things we've got to be a little cautious on, but there's a lot of stuff that people come in there for that's not going to hurt them and it's not going to hurt anything and, and, and it just won't work. If it's not right, it won't work. Have them take what your best guess is, take it with them with the understanding that if it's not right, they can do what? Make them feel good about the experience, all right? We've got to change the way we think. We've got to change how we see what we do. And that's the biggest challenge that I think you guys have in here. You've got to see yourself as we're in business to make money. You've got to get out of your mind this thing that, you know what, they're a Goliath, we're a David. No, we're a slinger. We're small, we're fast, we're agile, and we shoot at a distance. You want to come at me with a sword and a spear, that's fine. I'm just going to hit you in the head with a rock. Right. And we've got to do that. So we've got to change how we think and how we see things. You've got to use the tools you have. Your dealership's a strong place already. But you've got to use the tools you have around you. You've got to stretch yourselves up a little bit more and achieve more from that standpoint. Everybody do me a favor. Stand up for me real quick. I want you to put your hand in the air as high as you can put it. 
Okay, I already got somebody does it. Put your hand up higher. Go higher. Stretch higher now. Okay, now look around you. Some of you are already done. And how many people in here, if there's something that your butt's been on for an hour now, how many people could use that and go higher? Okay, go ahead and do it. Just don't hurt yourself. Get on your chair. It's the only way to do it. Okay, now how many people has gone higher now? Now I tell people again, how many people went higher the first time than the, the third time than the first time? When I say go higher, what do you guys do? Okay, Bob, I'm with you. And I said, no, go higher. You did what? Can we always go higher? Can we always stretch ourselves more? And that's really what it's all about. So stretch yourselves to do it. All right, thank you guys so much. God bless you all. Thanks.